Okay, so thank you very much. It's always extremely challenging being a rapporteur at an event like this because essentially you usually have two choices. Number one, you can write the conclusions before you ever come and then you have a nice well-presented presentation which looks really thought out. Or secondly, you can repeat to people what they've been hearing for the last two days and count the number of yawns you get per minute for the next 15 minutes while you speak. I didn't really want to do either of those things. So in trying to figure out how to report from the conference, I decided to try something a little different. And in a conference on education, I decided that if my clicker ever works, yes, to just talk about what I learned and the ideas I learned from listening to these various speakers at the conference. And hopefully to start a discussion with the rest of you, both in the coffee break, both afterwards, about what you learned, and hopefully we can do some of that famous remixing and resharing ideas and so on. Before I got to all of that, it is my duty to tell you, you will have a proper conference report. We have had an army of reporters, of cameramen, of technical people recording every tiny bit of the conference. This will all be brought together in a conference magazine with a description of each speech, with pictures, with video, with all of it. We'll need a couple of weeks to compile all of it, but every person in this room will be getting that. I've decided to try and figure out what I learned about the theme of the conference, about what is the state of digital education. And we actually had six themes of this conference, the first of which was openness and equity. And we heard about various kinds of open, open access, open pedagogy, open licenses, open content, open practices, many, many different kinds of open. And I think from what I've been hearing and what I've been hearing from the last few years, we really can talk about open education, not as something that's coming, something that's in the future, but something that is increasingly a reality for more people. It doesn't matter if we look at the number of open textbooks, the number of new pedagogies, the number of new open practices being introduced, whatever measure of open we take, it's on the increase and it's usually increasing exponentially. We are not all the way there yet or Cable would be out of a job, but we are definitely, definitely well on the way to open. On the other hand, the second lesson I took is that digital multiplies opportunities. But that comes with a caveat. And it's a rather big caveat, which a lot of you have been pointing out. And that is that the well-off are best positioned to take advantage of those opportunities. And in the spirit of remixing, this reminded me of a report I was involved in just a couple of years ago. And this is for Europe, so we are the privileged, where we said that actually, if you look at any indicator of equity in Europe, gender balance, net entry rates, entry via alternative routes, income gap of students, we are not equitable on any of these measures. And if you're from a lower socioeconomic background in Europe, you're less likely to attend higher education, less likely to choose a different course of study, less likely to work during studies, and far, far less likely to have a mobility experience in Europe. This is what we know from European Commission, from OECD reports. And I was wondering a little bit, as about technology supposed to change this, right? That's what we're hoping, and that's the question I think we've been asking ourselves. I haven't heard anyone in this conference definitively say that technology does change it. And this is another graph I pulled from a report, and this is essentially the graph at the top is the participation in higher education of people whose parents went to higher education. The blue one is the participation of people in higher education whose parents didn't go to higher education. And you see that since the 1970s, it's been increasing rather linearly. The thing is, this is our digital revolution. Usually when we have digital revolution graphs, there should be some sort of exponential thing there. So at least in the last 30 years, we've been having a slow, linear increase in participation, but I don't see any big spike because of digital yet. And the scary thing, when you extrapolate these two lines, it's going to take us till 2125 at current rates to actually reach equitable higher education just in Europe. So the lesson I learn is, for digital to increase equity, we need better ideas. We badly need better ideas. I see a lot of people in the room, a lot of initiatives trying to push it, but I do not think we have found the actual thing that says, listen, this digital technology will finally bring us equitable education. 
Moving on to the next theme about systems for accreditation and quality assurance of online learning. And what did I learn here? First of all, this comes from my own presentation, but it was, I actually thought it was the least important part of my presentation. It was that trust is about perception. And this people kept repeating and kept talking about the point that trust in education is about perception. We know that digital education is quality. The people in this room know. The people in this room know that you can fairly assess education done online. We know this. But there is a perception out there which this may not be the case. And from one of the plenaries, I'm sorry I don't know who said this, we need to leave our bubble to change perceptions. In short, we've got to stop preaching to the converted and actually get out there and bring these facts out there and change that perception. The other lesson, those of you who do framework program projects are very familiar with the technology readiness level graph, is that when we're talking about methodologies for quality assurance, methodologies for assessment, tools, technical tools for quality assurance and assessment, actually, we have all the technologies and all the methodologies we need to do good quality, good recognition, good accreditation. It doesn't matter if you take the example of the multi digital accreditation system, of the blockchain for the certification, or many of the other schemes you find around Europe. The technologies exist. Most of them have already been tested. Most of them have already uh, been proven in some way. So in terms of accreditation and QA of digital learning, what we're faced now is not a methodological problem. What we're faced with is a scale-up problem, a problem of how do we change the regulation to actually adopt these. And that's what I observed, at least, on accreditation. Moving on to the next area, innovation and digital pedagogies. I also found a few interesting things here, the first of which is looking at the type of MOOCs that were presented here, I'm going to propose to you that European publicly funded higher education is the real use case for the original kind of MOOC. It doesn't matter if we're having examples like the FUN uh, uh, platform from uh, France or the Silver MOOCs from Edinburgh. European publicly funded education actually gives you a way to deploy MOOCs and because the public uh, the public duty is already built into the mission of these institutions, they find a lot easier to find the financial reason to do the MOOCs. And I put this in context, those of you who are economist readers, The Economist this very week ran a feature on lifelong learning, basically saying that MOOCs are the future, but old MOOCs are dead, because now it's corporate training, it's MOOCs for charging, and so on. That may be the case, but here in Europe, we still have massive MOOC platforms running under the public model, and I have a feeling, not a lesson, a feeling that this will be a continued divergence of models from what I've seen from the cases I've heard presented to me at this conference. The next lesson, we've heard a lot of people talking about unbundling, and here I mean unbundling in the terms of micro-credentials. And the lesson I took from what I hear, I honestly think unbundling is unstoppable. We've had discussions about will micro-credentials replace degrees, will micro-credentials do this, will micro-credentials do that. I can't tell you what micro-credentials will do, but what I can tell you is micro-credentials are here and they're going to increase quickly. And the only real question for discussion is who will lead the micro-credentials revolution? Will it be the universities? Will it be the VET institutions? Will it be the businesses? And I think that is going to be the very big discussion over the next two or three years. Final lesson, and this is as much from what was not said at the conference as much as what was said. When I was looking at the, when I was looking at the program and thinking, okay, I have a digital pedagogy section, I expected to learn a lot about new fancy digital pedagogies. And to be honest, I didn't hear much. And I haven't heard much about the last six digital education conferences I've been to. And the truth is that digital pedagogies and possibly pedagogy as a whole, is still extremely immature. And what I mean by this, I pasted the link to a report from MIT. We know a lot about neuroscience. We know a lot about what works in education. We know a lot coming from behavioral science. But actually putting that all together and turning it into real concrete pedagogies, which we can use online, it is happening. Some institutions are trying it. 
I put this report up because it's my favorite example of it, but this is something which we're really just getting started at. Turning pedagogy into a hard science is something we're just getting started at, and there is practically unlimited scope to continue. So if I would create a technology readiness scale again for pedagogy, I'd say this is somewhere where the state of digital education is that we're still at our infancy and have a long, long, long way to grow. Teachers, learners, and digital education was the next theme of the conference. And simply enough, there's a massive digital divide within our own institutions. In the same institution, you can see a blackboard and VR helmets in the same institution today. I really don't think I need to say anything more about that. The second lesson was that technology has already created a global faculty and a global student body. And none of you said this in your talk. You did it. In the coffee breaks, there were people meeting, like their old friends who are meeting in person for the first time. If I was not to give you food, but give you Wi-Fi, you would choose the Wi-Fi, because half of you, even now, are communicating with faculty all over the world, and you cannot be, like, cut off from that connection. People have been going in and out of the room all the time to join video conferences, to join lectures. The global faculty is already here today. This is already happening, and it's the same for the student body. So we're not talking about a forming. We're not talking about people find like-minded individuals wherever they are, and we can really see this happening, and this phenomenon in education has already happened. Future trends in digital education. Now, honestly, from the speeches we heard, this is where I get totally and completely depressed. Um, my first question is, we're talking about future trends, but are we resisting change ourselves? Uh, one thing I noticed in this open conference is that as far as I know from the presentations I attended, Cable Green's presentation was the only one that actually had the Creative Commons logo on it. Yet we have all been talking about how this is amazing, how this is should we should do, but we're not doing it ourselves. Let me give another example. This is from those of you who know the Bologna process may know this quote. Ten years ago, we said, as every Minister of Education in Europe, that we share the societal aspiration that the student body entering, participating in, and completing higher education at all levels should reflect the diversity of our populations. Look around this room. Do you think the population here reflects the diversity of our populations? And I mean, look at me. I mean, a young, white, Western guy addressing another conference from a podium, it doesn't get more traditional than this. So do we really believe in this change? And I mean, are we actually practicing it ourselves? We then go on. First, we start talking about change. But the truth is, people weren't talking about change. People start talking about disruption. Again, we have a big argument about disruption. We've had several talks about what the future holds. And actually, the dominant paradigm in looking at the future, which I have seen in this room, is fear, fear of where will the new jobs of the future come from? Fear of are our skills good, our own skills as teachers, as educators? Fear about what type of society we're creating? And I mean, throughout, there has been this just undercurrent of fear of what the future begins. I don't think I've heard a single presentation where anybody gave me anything to look forward to in the future. I mean, seriously, I want Elon Musk's first rocket to the moon, to Mars, as soon as he can afford it. But, we move to the last point, and it's about best practices in policy design for digital education. So supposedly the policy will solve all of this. Now, in the immediate policy action, the outlines of immediate policy action are clear. You all know all everything that's on this slide. Mainstreaming open access, establishing QA, establishing mechanisms for digital trust, training even more teachers in digital competencies, supporting development of micro-credentials, expanding the use of distance learning, expanding the use of blended learning. You all know these policy prescriptions. And in the immediate time, these are clear. But none of these address that big fear, that big, what does the future bring? And the lesson 12 I bring, I think the big policy question, 
is what are the desirable future scenarios for our society and what is digital education's role in accelerating those. And I don't think that's something which at the moment we have an answer to. And I remember that uh, uh, Minister Bartolo mentioned that I believe it was an old OECD report where he said learning is about learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, learning to live together. And I ask what does this mean right now, what does this mean for the 21st century, and how can we adapt our education systems to get there? And so when I come to the famous question about what is the state of digital education today, I've been looking for a word for the whole two days, and the word I go away with is reactive. Digital education is reacting to trends in society. It's reacting to trends in technology. And the lesson I take is stop reacting. Education is supposed to lead. Education is supposed to educate us to create new futures, not to react to trends in technology. When did Apple become the global thought leader instead of our universities? When did Netflix become the global thought leader instead of our universities? And so, I'm going to leave you with a quote actually from Jeff, which I found extremely inspirational. And he said, there has never been a time when people from across the globe have come together to learn at this scale. My question to you is what are we going to do with it? Thank you for your attention.